if you have a few minutes for the word, amen? All right, raise your hand, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. All right, I got plenty of time. Thank you, Jesus. Let's get into the word. I found this little funny, little whatever you want to call it, little joke. I'll just read it to you really quickly. It says, my teachers told me that I'd never amount to much because I procrastinate often. And I told them, I said, just you wait. <laughs> Come on, it was, it was better than your response. Good Lord, okay, last one, I promise. The temporary Sunday school teacher was struggling to open a combination lock on the supply cabinet in the Sunday school room. And so she had been told the combination but couldn't quite remember it. Yes. Would you praise the Lord for Brother Joe? Thank you, my brother. It said she had been told the combination but she couldn't quite remember it. So finally she goes to the pastor's office and she asks for help. The pastor came into the room and he began to turn the dial. And after the first two numbers, he paused and then he stared blankly for a moment. And then finally, he looked heavenward and his lips moved silently. And then he looked back at the lock and quickly turned to the final number and it opened the lock. The teacher was amazed. She said, Pastor, I am in awe of your faith. He goes, ah, oh, it's really nothing. He goes, the number is on a piece of tape on the ceiling. Pastors always got tricks up their sleeves. No, I'm just kidding. Amen. Let's get into the word. How many of you are ready for the word of God this morning? Amen. This morning, the Lord has impressed upon my heart to minister to you a message that I've entitled the King of Glory. Amen. Psalms chapter 24, verse 7. Let's get into it this morning. It says, lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. The King of Glory may come in. Verse 8 says, who is this king of glory, it says the Lord strong and mighty, mighty in battle. It says lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? It says the Lord almighty, he is the king of glory. Amen. Let's just take a second to just pray. Father, we bless your name, Lord. Holy Spirit, in these next moments, God, I ask, Lord, that your word would be ministered, Father. It would be your word, Holy Spirit, and not my own. And, Father, I pray for every single person, God, within the sound of my voice, God, both in this room and those who are watching online. Father, I pray, Lord, that their eyes, their ears, God, would be open and their, mostly their hearts, God, would receive your truth, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, who is he, the King of glory? It says, the Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. Now, I want you to do this just for a second. I want you to stand up, and I just want you to thank the king of glory for being in this room right now. Stand up and give the Lord glory right now. Because he's not just any king. I'll say it again. I said he's not just any king. He has not lost power. He has not been dethroned. Amen. He is not just a king of religion, but his kingdom reigns forever. Amen. His kingdom is established in the heavens and his glory fills the earth. Come on, he's just walking into the room. Give him glory today. Yes, give him glory. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. He is here. Somebody say he is here. You may be seated this morning. He is here. John Piper said this, God is most glorified when you are most satisfied with him. God is most glorified when you are most satisfied with him. You know that his glory, church, it fills these places. It enters into this room. It enters into places that honor his name. The Lord is moved as such by those that honor his name. And it's God's essence to impart that glory on all men. Because where God is, his glory dwells. Amen? Where God is, his glory dwells. Exodus chapter 40. Let's read this. Verse 34 says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It said Moses could not enter the tent of, of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Verse 36, in all the travels of the Israelites, 
Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. Verse 37, but if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. And verse 38, it says, so the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all of their travels. You see, in the days of Moses, the glory of God would rest over that place, would rest over the tabernacle. It would cover the tent of meeting. But Moses had no place of entrance. He could not get in there because the glory of God had filled the space. And I want us to notice this, that whenever the cloud lifted, the people moved. That is, wherever the cloud of God's glory went, they went. And if it stopped, they stayed. If it rested in a place, they did not go forth because they could not go forth without God. And the Lord is looking for for us to be this in tune with his glory once again. For you and I to be in tune with the glory of God, to know that when God says speak, you speak. Amen? When he says open your eyes, you open your eyes. When he says pray, you pray. When he says give, you give. Amen? Amen? Do you understand the point this morning? Amen. And so listen, when they move, when the glory moved, they moved. And not the other way around, church. Not the other way around. And so the question of the hour is, are you moving outside of God's glory? You see, a lot of people are moving and they're doing and they're they're busy and they're about their life, but are you moving outside of God's glory? I should say it this way: are you moving outside of his covering? People make decisions every single day for their life. They make decisions for relationships and and family decisions, you know, what to buy and what not to buy, you know, where to live and and where not to live, where to go to school and such. And listen, it is so vital, it is so important that we don't move unless he moves. Many people want to do, say, go, play, listen, follow, and work. But the question is, the glory of God with you? Or is the glory of God not with you at all? Because listen, church, the king doesn't follow us. We follow him. I'll say that one more time. The king does not follow us. We follow him. Everything that you are designed with, everything in his plan for your life, is to surrender yourself and submit yourself before the king. Amen? Everything in us is, is, is called to submit before his throne. That when he says go, we go. When he says speak, we speak. But nowadays people get ahead of God. Amen? Getting ahead of God is like being in a war zone and leaving your troops. You have no defense. You just run out there like a hero thinking that you're going to take on the entire army by yourself. And you have no covering. You have no protection. You see, that's what getting ahead of God looks like. God didn't tell you to go there, but you got yourself in a situation. And guess what? He's gracious enough, church. The Bible says in Psalm 40, he's gracious enough to lift you out of the mud and the mire. And set your feet upon a solid rock. But listen, there's times when we've got to actually mature and grow up and stop moving out of the covering of God. We can't just be like, you know what, well, I went there and thank God that he, he wiped me off and he cleaned me again and he got me out of the mess. Listen, he doesn't want you to go there in the first place. He doesn't want you to move unless he moves. How many of you know that we need the glory of God? Amen. We need the glory of God in our churches once again. Amen. We need the power of God in our churches. God has not called us to entertain anybody. He's called us to preach the gospel. Amen. The only one that's getting entertained here is God. We entertain his presence. Amen. But let me help you understand this even deeper. That word glory in its definition contains three major parts. Judgment, salvation, and blessings. Judgment, salvation, and blessings. And these three things are very important in understanding this king of glory that I am speaking about today. Judgment in Psalm 9, 8, the the Bible says that he rules the world in righteousness and he judges the peoples with equity. What does equity mean? Simply put, it's the value between what was paid and what you owe. 
If I bought a house that was 200000 and now I owe 150000 the equity is 50000 What's the point? God is righteous and God is perfect and he judges based on the value of his righteousness. He judges based on the value of his glory and the payment of his son, Jesus Christ. He's perfect, church. He's holy. We were singing that song right now, holy is the Lord. He is holy. The Bible says that our works to God are as filthy rags. Say, Pastor Duke, I've come to church every single day in my life. That to God is nothing. We're justified only through Christ and the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. Romans 3 and 23 says, for all have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. All includes who? Everybody. All includes everyone. This is why Moses could not enter the glory of God's presence because he was sinful. And no man can step into the glory of God's presence unless they are saved. Which leads me to the next point. Salvation. The glory of God contains judgment, salvation, and blessing. Let's keep reading Romans chapter 3. Verse 24 says, And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. How many of you know what that word atonement means? Atonement means to pay the price for. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. That is, there's no payment for sin. So it goes on to say God presented Christ, his son, as the sacrifice of payment through the shedding of his blood to be received by us in faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, forbearance means patience. In his patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished, but he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. You see, you don't have to miss out on the glory of God. That's the beautiful thing about the Lord is that his invitation of love and mercy is offered to every single man. His invitation of his goodness and his, and his power is offered to every single person if you would just have faith and believe in Jesus. Amen? Because the Bible says that all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus. Did you know, church, that he sacrificed his life for you? Amen? Amen? Did you know that he gave his life for our sins? He was, as the scripture describes, he was like a lamb led to the shearer. He was holy and blameless. He was without spot. And he was the perfect sacrifice. You see, there was no other method, there was no other mode, there was no other plan to get you to heaven except through Jesus. The Bible says that he is the way, he is the what? He is the truth and he is what? He is the life and no one goes to the Father except through him. So he lives sinless wholly before his Father. And that outstanding debt of sin and unrighteousness was paid for us by him. It was paid for you and I. In other words, church, he went to the bank on your behalf. How many of you would like somebody to go to the bank on your behalf nowadays? Well, man, man, that was weak. Nayeli gets it. She, she's like, yeah, yeah, go to the bank for me, Jesus. I said, how many of you want the Lord to go to the bank for you on your behalf? Amen. That is, he went to the bank on your behalf and he said, how much do they owe on this house? He said, I'll make one payment in their name so they're no longer in debt, but they're owners and they're heirs of my kingdom. That gets me excited this morning. I said, that gets me excited this morning, church, because you might say, how could he do this? You want to know how he did it? Because he loves you more than you will ever know. He loves you more than you will ever know. He loves you beyond your faults because before you were formed in your mother's womb, he had a plan for your life. 
He had a perfect designed plan for your life and he carefully wrote out that plan. Not only that you would share in his glory, but that you would give glory to the name above all names for the rest of your life. Come on, somebody give him praise this morning. And this king of glory church is still looking for hearts to inhabit. So this king of glory is still looking for someone that he can pour out his glory into their life. He's still looking for men and women to whom he can redeem. He's still looking to lift the dead of sin off of your life. And the third thing that it leads us to is the glory of God. It contains blessings. Amen. How many of you want blessings in your life? Amen. Come on. It's often been said this. If Jesus didn't do another thing for us beyond the cross, then he's already done enough. Amen. If he didn't do anything else, if all he did was the work on the cross, then guess what? He's done enough. He has done enough because through the blood of Jesus, we, we have everything, amen? Through the blood of Jesus, we have access to everything because we have access to the Father. And the Bible says that the earth is his footstool and he has the cattle of a thousand hills. The, the God that you are serving, church, is rich and he's mighty. He has everything that you need. Every single thing that you need, amen? But my God is not just a God that will pay for one meal. Every day, he is the bread of life. I said, my God is not just a God that will pay for one meal. Every day he will give you the bread of life. Every day, church, he is a well that will not run dry. Every moment he provides for his children. Every moment and in every circumstance he is able. In him you have access to healing. Oh, come on, somebody. In him you have access to grace. In him he gives you renewed mercy every single day. You see, he gives, but he keeps on giving. He is a God of abundance and a God of overflow. John 10.10 says the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus said, but I have come life that they may have life abundantly. How many of you know what the abundant life of Jesus feels like? Amen. How many of you are living in overflow right now? God is good. Every day the Lord shows us compassion, church. Every single day, he shows you compassion, and guess what? The Bible says his compassion fails not. Whatever you need is what he contains. Whatever you need is what he contains. Philippians 4 and 19, I love this verse. It says, and my God will meet all of your needs. Everybody say, all my needs. According to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. I love that. According to the riches of his glory. When you worship him and you exalt him and his glory fills your heart and your life. It's so rich, church. It's not just rich from like a financial way of looking at it. It's so powerful and potent. The weight of his glory is so heavy. We're so limited to be able to contain this massive, endless, eternal, and infinite God. But the beauty of who he is is that he offers himself to you. He offers himself to me. And this is why we need the glory of God, amen? Because without the glory, we are without God. I said without the glory, we are without God. God, without the glory, we are outside of salvation. Without the glory of God filling your hearts, then we can expect judgment according to our sin. Without the glory, we cannot say, as the scripture says, we cannot say that we who are weak are now strong. You see, only the glory gives you access to that. We cannot say, though we are poor, that we are actually rich because only the glory of God gives you access to that. Because if you are outside of Jesus and you sing that song, let the weak say that I am strong. You're still weak. <laughs> let the poor say I'm rich. You check your bank account. You're still poor. But with, everybody say with. Everybody say with. Listen, church, then you will be blessed in the city. Amen. And you will be blessed in the field. Amen. Because without the glory of God. 
Without the glory of God, we are nothing more than spiritual theorists. You are nothing more than a spiritual theorist. What does that mean? That means that you're just somebody that reads about him. You're just somebody that hears songs about him. You just go to a place and they gather and you don't even realize that he's here. You're just happy and content coming to church, going through the religious experience. Stand up, sit down, say amen when they tell you to, read the verse, and go home. I don't want anybody in this place to stay a spiritual theorist. When the Bible says that you can know the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen. Somebody say this. Say, with his glory. Say it like you mean it. With his glory. Zechariah 2 and 5 says, the Lord will be a wall of fire around you, declares the Lord. He said, and I will be its glory within. You see, with the Lord Church, you have the wraparound presence of God in your life. He's above you, beside you, in front of you, below you. He goes before you get there. He fights the battles that you cannot fight. Amen. He intercedes on your behalf on a daily basis. Amen. That verse that we just read, it speaks of the glory and the presence of God surrounding his people. How many of you need that presence in your life? Amen. You need God in your life. No matter what accusations come for you, God will be your shield. Amen. No matter what arrows are shot towards your life, God will deflect and protect your life. You see, with God and our God, church, he isn't far from his children. It's what I love about him. He is not far from his children, but rather those who have said yes to Jesus. He is within you. He is upon you, and he is around you. I love that verse, and forgive me for not knowing it off the top of my head, but it says this. It basically says this. It says, the glory of God has been made plain for all to see so that men are without excuse. That is the glory of God, the power of God, the, the fact that we have a creator and he has established this creation, this world that we live in. The Bible says that it's so evident that God exists. It's so evident that his power and his nature is real that man will not have an excuse. Amen? And the Bible says that one day we will all have to give an account for our life. We'll all have to stand before the Lord. Amen. And give an account for our life. But the Lord himself, he's not far. Psalm 139 says this. Verse 7 says, where can I go from your spirit? You see, that means the Lord is all around us. Where can I flee from your presence? He said, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. And if I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Isaiah verse, uh, chapter 60 verse 1 says, so arise and shine for your light has come. It says, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. Everybody say me. It says, see darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. It says, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. And it says, and nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. You see, it's time for the people of God to stop soaking in despair. I realize we live in a, in a pretty nutty world right now. Things are so backwards. Things are so against what God has written. There is an attack on the establishment of the standard of the word of God. Amen? There is a, there is a spiritual attack against what the, what the word of God says. And guess what? You can't erase it. Like it or not, you can't ever erase it because the Bible says heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will remain forever. It will remain forever, church. It will remain forever. But to the people of God, listen, stop worrying about the world. 
Stop worrying about what it is that you are existing in. Stop worrying about the darkness that's rising in the earth because the Bible says the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over your life. His glory appears over your life. The Bible says the glory of God is a gift from God. John 17, he said, I have given them the glory that you gave me. This is Jesus speaking. He said that they may be one as we are one. He said, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You see, oftentimes after the most glorious you know, time in the presence of God, the enemy will try to plant seeds of division. You might leave this service today and somebody's going to say something. The enemy's going to have something to say. He's going to try to put in his two cents. Why? Because part of sharing in the glory that Jesus gave us is the responsibility to live in harmony and unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And the rest of the church said, Amen. Amen. Part of the responsibility of carrying the glory of God, the very gift that Jesus offered to you and I that he has gotten from his father, is to live in harmony with our brothers and sisters in Christ, thus exemplifying the perfect union between the father and the son. Because it's only then, church, it's only then that the world will know that Jesus was sent for us, amen, and that God loves the world like he loves his son. You know, there's more denominations of Christianity than people in church nowadays. And what is it signifying? Division. It signifies division. There was a man that stood up in front of a massive council of people and and he, he said these things. He said, where are the Baptists? And everybody goes, ah. Where the where the Pentecostals? Where's the you know you know first church of you know Corinthian of you know Baptistical whatever? <laughs> Where's the church of Guadalupe Maria you know Santo whatever? <sighs> and he goes, guess what? Somebody's wrong. Somebody's wrong. We're all reading the same text here, aren't we? Yeah, we we are, but somebody's wrong. And Jesus was talking about this. Jesus was saying, listen, from the get-go, you guys are going to (laughs) separate. From the get-go, you guys are going to say some follow Paul, some follow Apollo, some follow, you know, all these different people, ministers of that time. And listen, he was trying to get our attention and get us to understand this, that the glory of God should unify us. Amen. The presence of God should actually bring us together. Amen. So when you go down to the to, to your friend's church down the road or what have you, or you talk to your friend after church and, and you ask how their church was, listen, don't worry about what they did. Love them like Jesus loves you. Amen. Show unity in the church once again. Because listen, church, if he's truly your king, then you won't participate in that which won't bring him glory. I'll say that one more time. If he's truly your king, you will not participate in the things that do not bring him glory. Did you know, church, that the glory of God is the work of the Holy Spirit? I said the glory of God is the work of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And it says, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It says, and we all with unveiled faces, that means they're not covered, contemplate the Lord's glory and being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. I've been a minister now for 18 years of my life, and I've had the opportunity to minister in front of a lot of people. And you can tell who senses the glory, and you can tell who can't. It's pretty obvious. It's actually pretty easy. I don't need, like, some magical powers or, or, you know, some crazy discernment to know whose face is unveiled. To know whose life is unveiled. To know those that are actually truly walking in freedom 
because the Lord makes it plain for us to see. Whenever anyone turns to him, the veil is taken away. Have you turned to him? Not religion. Not what you've always done. I would even go as far as saying this. If you don't remember the day that you said yes to Jesus, then you probably don't know him at all. I've asked people that question before. Do you remember when you got saved? I don't know. I've always gone to church. Then my friend, my friend, I would ask you to turn to the Lord. Turn to him. Turn to Jesus. Amen. This is such a mystery of God, but it's plain to see for those who are in Jesus. Amen. It's plain to see when the Holy Spirit begins to move. This is why there's such deception in the church today. Because a lot of people will walk into a church and they won't even know if the Spirit of God's not there. Oh. A lot of people will go into a church that looks like a club and you won't even know that the Spirit of God's not there. You say, well, they said Jesus' name at some point. I don't know. I think the pastor cracked open the Bible once or twice. I, I have no idea. It's not a pastor. That's a TED talker. You see, back in the days of the, of the early church, back in the days of, of, the, of the early church, all they had was the Holy Spirit. Amen? All they had was the Holy Spirit. I think it was Reinhard Bonnke said, he said, listen, you know, back then that church, all they had was the Holy Spirit. And they probably had 5% of everything else. 5% of the gathering, 5% of the eating, you know, bread together. He goes, and nowadays it's the total opposite. He goes, you got to keep coffee and cake ready at every service so that people will come. You see, God's glory, church, is not to be messed with. If we say that we want to know him and if we truly desire to have a relationship with him, then we must draw near. Amen. And the Bible says that he will draw near to you. He will come into your life. Amen. But when the glory of God begins to move in an atmosphere like this, your heart begins to draw into the glory that he is, he is releasing from his life. You see, and if you're not drawn in, if you're not prostrate before God, if you cannot feel the weight of the glory of his goodness and his presence, if you cannot shout and you cannot run in freedom and you cannot dance, then I tell you, church, you don't know him. Because when you know him, when you know him, when you know him, when you've heard his voice, everything changes. You lose all ability to think for yourself. You have no control over your character because he's Lord. You see, when I came to Jesus, I said yes to the Lord at 15 years old, and I gave my heart to Jesus. I bowed down before him, and I said, God, I renounce the world, Lord. Come into my heart, oh God. Come into my life, oh God. And in that moment, church, in that moment, I felt the power of the glory of God wash over my life. Every single thing that I had done, every single chain of my past, everything, everything, it was broken. It was broken because he said it is finished. And some of you need to come back to Jesus. You need to come back to that place where you're not worried about the person to your right and you're not worried about the person to your left. You just want to give him glory. You see, people nowadays are ashamed to come to the altar because they think everyone's going to shame them. And they think that everybody's going to condemn them. And they think, oh, that brother's got sin in his life. No, he wants Jesus. He wants forgiveness. He wants God to change his life. Don't let the devil shame you into thinking that God does not want. Listen, we all have to come back to him. Come on, every single day I ask God, renew your mercy over my life, oh God. Every single day, Father, I say, Lord, if I have done something, God, that has offended your heart, oh God, cleanse me, Lord. See, this should happen every day. This is not a once in a lifetime thing. This is not a once saved, always saved type of thing. So when you've tasted the glory of his goodness, you're transformed. The Bible says the old is gone and the new has come. You are no longer living under the shadow of condemnation and sin. 
but you're now living for the glory of the one who has formed your life. And every single day that scripture just said, you're being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. I want God to increase in my life. This ain't enough. I want God to increase in my life. This isn't enough, amen? It's not enough to know him like we did yesterday, church, amen? And this is my prayer for your life as well, that the Lord would get a hold of your life, that you would be so abandoned to the glory of God that you would say, God, increase your glory in my life every single day. Increase your presence, oh God, in my life every single day. Could somebody say amen? amen? But listen, I have to say this. If you're listening to me and you're already looking at the clock, do you know that the glory is offensive? <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna go there. All right, let's go. The glory is offensive, it's uncomfortable, it's bothersome. You wanna know why? Because his glory does not answer to you, you respond to him. Amen. See, I already know who's got the glory, and I already know who doesn't. His glory is of unlimited supply, and his glory will remain as long as it wants. His glory doesn't have to adhere to your schedule. His glory doesn't have to cooperate with your taste. His glory does not have to make sense to you. His glory irritates the demonic and bound. You see, it was said that you cannot hold God hostage to your questions. He's ruler and he reigns, church. But we should realize that we were born to live in the glory of God. You were born to live in the glory of God. And the only access to this glory is by being born again. You see, demons cannot be born again. Satan is done. He is finished. He missed his chance. He was in heaven, but because of pride, God cast him down. And listen, those who are prideful in these last days will be cast down. Those who say, you know what, uh, I, I'm okay, I gotta, I gotta maintain my posture in the glory of God. No, you don't. No, you don't. The Bible says, he who is humble will be exalted, but he who is proud. God opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. Imagine having the God of this universe, the most powerful being, opposing you. That's a fight you'll never win. You will never win the opposition of God. But listen, you have the opportunity to let God be God in your life. Not to have a religious experience, not to become part of a church, but to receive the precious gift of salvation. Hebrews 2 and 10 says this, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am and the children that God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the death, and that is the devil. But to free those who have all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. When you come to Jesus, you come to his glory. When you come to Jesus, you become part of the precious family of saints that Jesus knows. Amen. When you come to Jesus, you now live in the glory with the one who broke off the power of the enemy to destroy your life. And it's only him, Jesus, that can free your life. Because this glory that we receive today in him is preparing us for an eternity in the glory of God. Amen. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 4 says this. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him. Where? Come on, where? In glory, church, there is a day that is coming. Oh, come on, somebody. I said there is a day that is coming when those who know the king of glory will be able to live and reign in his presence forever in glory, church. I'm looking forward to that day. I don't know about you. I said I'm looking forward to that day. I don't know about you. 
Do you know the King of glory? Is he reigning as Lord of your life? Is he reigning? See, this morning we have this beautiful communion table present. And this represents an acknowledgement of thanksgiving for the body of Jesus that was broken for our sins. And the blood that poured from his side to bring us forgiveness, eternal life, and access to the glory of God. But I have to say this. The Holy Spirit convicted me strongly to say this. And if you're listening to me, I need you to heed this warning. Before we partake of this meal, the Bible says that no one should take this in an unworthy manner. That means if you are not saved, don't take it. If you're not saved, don't take it. If you refuse to receive the gift of God's salvation, don't take it. That means if you are saved and you have unforgiveness in your heart that has not been dealt with, don't take it. There could be somebody in your life, there could be somebody that's been a burden to you that when you see them, your blood boils and you get angry because, because you're just you're frustrated with them or they said something about you. Listen, if there's unforgiveness in your heart, do not take it. 1 Corinthians 11 says this, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many amongst you are weak and sick. And a number of you have even fallen asleep. But if you were more discerning with the regard to ourselves, then we would not come under such judgment. So this morning, I'm going to open the altar for us. And this is for everyone. And like I said, nobody is here to pass judgment. But if you need to ask the Lord to cleanse your life, then I'm going to ask you to come today. Amen. In fact, I would love everyone to come. Because nobody is able to judge your soul except God. And this is important. Even if he sees the smallest thing, he knows.